Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Eight, of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Eight, wherein is related what befell Don Quixote on his way to see his lady dulcinea del toboso blessed be allah the all-powerful says hamete benengeli on beginning this eighth chapter blessed be allah he repeats three times and he says he utters these thanksgivings at seeing that he has now got don quixote and sancho fairly afield and that the readers of his delightful history may reckon that the achievements and humours of don quixote and his squire are now about to begin and he urges them to forget the former chivalries of the ingenious gentlemen and to fix their eyes on those that are to come which now begin on the road to el toboso as the others began on the plains of montiel nor is it much that he asks in consideration of all he promises and so he goes on to say don quixote and sancho were left alone in the moment samson took his departure rocinante began to neigh and dapple to sigh which by both knight and squire was accepted as a good sign and a very happy omen though if the truth is to be told the sighs and brays of dapple were louder than the neighings of the hack from which sancho inferred that his good fortune was to exceed and overtop that of his master building perhaps upon some judicial astrology that he may have known though the history says nothing about it all that can be said is that when he stumbled or fell he was heard to say he wished he had not come out for by stumbling or falling there was nothing to be got but a damaged shoe or a broken rib and fool as he was he was not much astray in this said don quixote sancho my friend night is drawing on upon us as we go and more darkly than will allow us to reach el toboso by daylight for there i am resolved to go before i engage in another adventure and there i shall obtain the blessing and generous permission of the peerless dulcinea with which permission i expect and feel assured that i shall conclude and bring to a happy termination every perilous adventure for nothing in life makes knights errant more valorous than finding themselves favoured by their ladies so i believe replied sancho but i think it will be difficult for your worship to speak with her or see her at any rate where you will be able to receive her blessing unless indeed she throws it over the wall of the yard where i saw her the time before when i took her the letter that told of the follies and mad things your worship was doing in the heart of sierra morena didst thou take that for a yard wall sancho said don quixote where or at which thou sawest that neverly sufficiently extolled grace and beauty it must have been the gallery corridor or portico of some rich and royal palace it might have been all that returned sancho but to me it looked like a wall unless i am short of memory at all events let us go there sancho said don quixote for so that i see her it is the same to me whether it be over a wall or at a window or through the chink of a door or the grate of a garden for any beam of the sun of her beauty that reaches my eyes will give light to my reason and strength to my heart so that i shall be unmatched and unequalled in wisdom and valour well to tell the truth senor said sancho when i saw that son of the lady dulcinea del toboso it was not bright enough to throw out beams at all it must have been that as her grace was sifting that wheat i told you of the thick dust she raised came before her face like a cloud and dimmed it what dost thou still persist sancho said don quixote in saying thinking believing and maintaining that my lady dulcinea was sifting wheat that being an occupation and task entirely at variance with what is and should be the employment of persons of distinction who are constituted and reserved for other avocations and pursuits that show their rank a bow-shot off thou hast forgotten o sancho those lines of our poet wherein he paints for us how in their crystal abodes those four nymphs employed themselves who rose from their loved tagus and seated themselves in a verdant meadow to embroider those tissues which the ingenious poet there describes to us how they were worked and woven with gold and silk and pearls and something of this sort must have been the employment of my lady when thou sawest her 
only that the spite which some wicked enchanter seems to have against everything of mine changes all those things that give me pleasure and turns them into shapes unlike their own and so i fear that in that history of my achievements which they say is now in print if haply its author was some sage who was an enemy of mine he will have put one thing for another mingling a thousand lies with one truth and amusing himself by relating transactions which have nothing to do with the sequence of a true history oh envy root of all countless evils and canker-worm of the virtues all the vices sancho bring some kind of pleasure with them but envy brings nothing but irritation bitterness and rage so i say too replied sancho and i suspect in that legend or history of us that the bachelor samson carrasco told us he saw my honour goes dragged in the dirt knocked about up and down sweep in the streets as they say and yet on the faith of an honest man i never spoke ill of any enchanter and i am not so well off that i am to be envied to be sure i am rather sly and i have a certain spice of the rogue in me but all is covered by the great cloak of my simplicity always natural and never acted and if i had no other merit save that i believe as i always do firmly and truly in god and all the holy roman catholic church holds and believes and that i am a mortal enemy of the jews the historians ought to have mercy on me and treat me well in their writings but let them say what they like naked was i born naked i find myself i neither lose nor gain nay while i see myself put into a book and passed on from hand to hand over the world i don't care a fig let them say what they like of me that sancho returned don quixote reminds me of what happened to a famous poet of our own day who having written a bitter satire against all the courtesan ladies did not insert or name in it a certain lady of whom it was questionable whether she was one or not she seeing she was not in the list of the poet asked him what he had seen in her that he did not include her in the number of the others telling him he must add to his satire and put her in the new part or else look out for the consequences the poet did as she bade him and left her without a shred of reputation and she was satisfied by getting fame though it was infamy in keeping with this is what they relate of that shepherd who set fire to the famous temple of diana by repute one of the seven wonders of the world and burned it with the sole object of making his name live in after ages and though it was forbidden to name him or mention his name by word of mouth or in writing lest the object of his ambition should be attained nevertheless it became known that he was called erostratus and something of the same sort is what happened in the case of the great emperor charles v and a gentleman in rome the emperor was anxious to see that famous temple of the rotunda called in ancient times the temple of all the gods but nowadays by a better nomenclature of all the saints which is the best preserved building of all those of pagan construction in rome and the one which best sustains the reputation of mighty works and magnificence of its founders it is in the form of a half orange of enormous dimensions and well lighted though no light penetrates it save that which is admitted by a window or rather round skylight at the top and it was from this that the emperor examined the building a roman gentleman stood by his side and explained to him the skilful construction and ingenuity of the vast fabric and its wonderful architecture and when they had left the skylight he said to the emperor a thousand times your sacred majesty the impulse came upon me to seize your majesty in my arms and fling myself down from yonder skylight so as to leave behind me in the world a name that would last for ever i am thankful to you for not carrying such an evil thought into effect said the emperor and i shall give you no opportunity in future of again putting your loyalty to the test and i therefore forbid you ever to speak to me or to be where i am and he followed up these words by bestowing a liberal bounty upon him my meaning is sancho that the desire of acquiring fame is a very powerful motive what thinkest thou was it that flung horatius in full armour down from the bridge into the depths of the tiber what burned the hand and arm of mucius what impelled curtius to plunge into the deep burning gulf that opened in the midst of rome what in opposition to all the omens that declared against him made julius caesar cross the rubicon and to come to more modern examples what scuttled the ships and left stranded and cut off the gallant spaniards under the command of the most courteous cortez in the new world 
all these and a variety of other great exploits are were and will be the work of fame that mortals desire as a reward and a portion of the immortality their famous deeds deserve but we catholic christians and knights errant look more to that future glory that is everlasting in the ethereal regions of heaven than to the vanity of the fame that is to be acquired in this present transitory life a fame that however long it may last must after all end with the world itself which has its own appointed end so that o sancho in what we do we must not overpass the bounds which the christian religion we profess has assigned to us we have to slay pride and giants envy by generosity and nobleness of heart anger by calmness of demeanour and equanimity gluttony and sloth by the spareness of our diet and the length of our vigils lust and lewdness by the loyalty we preserve to those whom we have made the mistresses of our thoughts indolence by traversing the world in all directions seeking opportunities of making ourselves besides christians famous knights such sancho are the means by which we reach those extremes of praise that fair fame carries with it all that your worship has said so far said sancho i have understood quite well but still i would be glad if your worship would dissolve a doubt for me which has just this minute come into my mind solve thou meanest sancho said don quixote say on in god's name and i will answer as well as i can tell me senor sancho went on to say those julys or augusts and all those venturous knights that you say are now dead where are they now the heathens replied don quixote are no doubt in hell the christians if they were good christians are either in purgatory or in heaven very good said sancho but now i want to know the tombs where the bodies of those great lords are have they silver lamps before them or are the walls of their chapels ornamented with crutches winding sheets tresses of hair legs and eyes in wax or what are they ornamented with to which don quixote made answer the tombs of the heathens were generally sumptuous temples the ashes of julius caesar's body were placed on the top of a stone pyramid of vast size which they now call in rome st peter's needle the emperor hadrian had for a tomb a castle as large as a good-sized village which they called the molus adriani and is now the castle of st angelo in rome the queen artemisia buried her husband mausolus in a tomb which was reckoned one of the seven wonders of the world but none of these tombs or of the many others of the heathens were ornamented with winding sheets or any of those other offerings and tokens that show that they who are buried there are saints that's the point i'm coming to said sancho and now tell me which is the greater work to bring a dead man to life or to kill a giant the answer is easy replied don quixote it is a greater work to bring to life a dead man now i have got you said sancho in that case the fame of them who bring the dead to life who give sight to the blind cure cripples restore health to the sick and before whose tombs there are lamps burning and whose chapels are filled with devout folk on their knees adoring their relics be a better fame in this life and in the other than that which all the heathen emperors and knights errant that have ever been in the world have left or may leave behind them that i grant too said don quixote then this fame these favours these privileges or whatever you call it said sancho belong to the bodies and relics of the saints who with the approbation and permission of our holy mother church have lamps tapers winding sheets crutches pictures eyes and legs by means of which they increase devotion and add to their own christian reputation kings carry the bodies or relics of saints on their shoulders and kiss bits of their bones and enrich and adorn their oratories and favourite altars with them what wouldst thou have me infer from all thou hast said sancho asked don quixote my meaning is said sancho let us set about becoming saints and we shall obtain more quickly the fair fame we are striving after for you know senor yesterday or the day before yesterday for it is so lately one may say so they canonized and beatified two little barefoot friars and it is now reckoned the greatest good luck to kiss or touch the iron chains with which they girt and tortured their bodies and they are held in greater veneration so it is said than the sword of roland in the armoury of our lord the king whom god preserve so that senor it is better to be an humble little friar of no matter what order than a valiant knight-errant with god a couple of dozen of penance lashings are of more avail than two thousand lance thrusts 
be they given to giants or monsters or dragons all that is true returned don quixote but we cannot all be friars and many are the ways by which god takes his own to heaven chivalry is a religion there are sainted knights in glory yes said sancho but i have heard say that there are more friars in heaven than knights errant that said don quixote is because those in religious orders are more numerous than knights the errants are many said sancho many replied don quixote but few they who deserve the name of knights with these and other discussions of the same sort they passed that night and the following day without anything worth mention happening to them whereat don quixote was not a little dejected but at length the next day at daybreak they descried the great city of el toboso at the sight of which don quixote's spirits rose and sancho's fell for he did not know dulcinea's house nor in all his life had he ever seen her any more than his master so that they were both uneasy the one to see her the other at not having seen her and sancho was at a loss to know what he was to do when his master sent him to el toboso in the end don quixote made up his mind to enter the city at nightfall and they waited until the time came among some oak trees that were near el toboso and when the moment they had agreed upon arrived they made their entrance into the city where something happened them that may fairly be called something end of volume two part two chapter eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter nine of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter nine wherein is related what will be seen there twas at the very midnight hour more or less when don quixote and sancho quitted the wood and entered el toboso the town was in deep silence for all the inhabitants were asleep and stretched on the broad of their backs as the saying is the night was darkish though sancho would have been glad had it been quite dark so as to find in the darkness an excuse for his blundering all over the place nothing was to be heard except the barking of dogs which deafened the ears of don quixote and troubled the heart of sancho now and then an ass brayed pigs grunted cats mewed and the various noises they made seemed louder in the silence of the night all which the enamoured knight took to be of evil omen nevertheless he said to sancho sancho my son lead on to the palace of dulcinea it may be that we shall find her awake body of the sun what palace am i to lead to said sancho when what i saw her highness in was only a very little house most likely she had then withdrawn into some small apartment of her palace said don quixote to amuse herself with damsels as great ladies and princesses are accustomed to do senor said sancho if your worship will have it in spite of me that the house of my lady dulcinea is a palace is this an hour think you to find the door open and will it be right for us to go knocking till they hear us and open the door making a disturbance and confusion all through the household are we going do you fancy to the house of our wenches like gallants who come and knock and go in at any hour however late it may be let us first of all find out the palace for certain replied don quixote and then i will tell thee sancho what we had best do but look sancho for either i see badly or that dark mass that one sees from here should be dulcinea's palace then let your worship lead the way said sancho perhaps it may be so though i see it with my eyes and touch it with my hands i'll believe it as much as i believe it is daylight now don quixote took the lead and having gone a matter of two hundred paces he came upon the mass that produced the shade and found it was a great tower and then he perceived that the building in question was no palace but the chief church of the town and said he it's the church we have lit upon sancho so i see said sancho and god grant we may not light upon our graves it is no good thing to find oneself wandering in a graveyard at this time of night and that after my telling your worship if i don't mistake that the house of this lady will be in an alley without an outlet the curse of god on thee for a blockhead said don quixote where hast thou ever heard of castles and royal palaces being built in alleys without an outlet 
senor replied sancho every country has a way of its own perhaps here in el toboso it is a way to build palaces and grand buildings and alleys so i entreat your worship to let me search about among these streets or alleys before me and perhaps in some corner or other i may stumble on this palace and i wish i saw the dogs eating it for leading us such a dance speak respectfully of what belongs to my lady sancho said don quixote let us keep the feast in peace and not throw the rope after the bucket i hold my tongue said sancho but how am i to take it patiently when your worship wants me with only once seeing the house of our mistress to know it always and to find it in the middle of the night when your worship can't find it who must have seen it thousands of times thou wilt drive me to desperation sancho said don quixote look here heretic have i not told thee a thousand times that i have never once in my life seen the peerless dulcinea or crossed the threshold of her palace and that i am enamoured solely by hearsay and by the great reputation she bears for beauty and discretion i hear it now returned sancho and i may tell you that if you have not seen her no more have i that cannot be said don quixote for at any rate thou saidst on bringing back the answer to the letter i sent by thee that thou sawest her sifting wheat don't mind that senor said sancho i must tell you that my seeing her and the answer i brought you back were by hearsay too for i can no more tell who the lady dulcinea is than i can hit the sky sancho sancho said don quixote there are times for jests and times when jests are out of place if i tell thee that i have neither seen nor spoken to the lady of my heart it is no reason why thou shouldst say thou hast not spoken to her or seen her when the contrary is the case as thou well knowest while the two were engaged in this conversation they perceived some one with a pair of mules approaching the spot where they stood and from the noise the plough made as it dragged along the ground they guessed him to be some labourer who had got up before daybreak to go to his work and so it proved to be he came along singing the ballad that says ill did ye fare ye men of france and roncesvalles is chase may i die sancho said don quixote when he heard him if any good will come to us to-night dost thou not hear what that clown is singing i do said sancho but what has roncesvalles chase to do with what we have in hand he might just as well be singing the ballad of calainus for any good or ill that can come to us in our business by this time the labourer had come up and don quixote asked him can you tell me worthy friend and god speed you whereabouts here is the palace of the peerless princess doña dulcinea del toboso senor replied the lad i am a stranger and i have been only a few days in the town doing farm work for a rich farmer in that house opposite there live the curate of the village and the sacristan and both or either of them will be able to give your worship some account of this lady princess for they have a list of all the people of el toboso though it is my belief there is not a princess living in the whole of it many ladies there are of quality and in her own house each of them may be a princess well then she i am inquiring for will be one of these my friend said don quixote may be so replied the lad god be with you for here comes the daylight and without waiting for any more of his questions he whipped on his mules sancho seeing his master downcast and somewhat dissatisfied said to him senor daylight will be here before long and it will not do for us to let the sun find us in the street it will be better for us to quit the city and for your worship to hide in some forest in the neighbourhood and i will come back in the daytime and i won't leave a nook or corner of the whole village that i won't search for the house castle or palace of my lady and it will be hard luck for me if i don't find it and as soon as i have found it i will speak to your grace and tell her where and how your worship is waiting for her to arrange some plan for you to see her without any damage to her honour and reputation sancho said don quixote thou hast delivered a thousand sentences condensed in the compass of a few words i thank thee for the advice thou hast given me and take it most gladly come my son let us go look for some place where i may hide while thou dost return as thou sayest to seek and speak with my lady from whose discretion and courtesy i look for favours more than miraculous sancho was in a fever to get his master out of the town lest he should discover the falsehood of the reply he had brought to him in the sierra morena on behalf of dulcinea so he hastened their departure which they took at once and two miles out of the village they found a forest or thicket wherein don quixote ensconced himself 
while sancho returned to the city to speak to dulcinea in which embassy things befell him which demand fresh attention and a new chapter end of volume two part two chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Ten, of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Ten wherein is related the crafty device sancho adopted to enchant the lady dulcinea and other incidents as ludicrous as they are true when the author of this great history comes to relate what is set down in this chapter he says he would have preferred to pass it over in silence fearing it would not be believed because here don quixote's madness reaches the confines of the greatest that can be conceived and even goes a couple of bowshots beyond the greatest but after all though still under the same fear and apprehension he has recorded it without adding to the story or leaving out a particle of the truth and entirely disregarding the charges of falsehood that might be brought against him and he was right for the truth may run fine but will not break and always rises above falsehood as oil above water and so going on with his story he says that as soon as don quixote had ensconced himself in the forest oak grove or wood near el toboso he bade sancho return to the city and not come into his presence again without having first spoken on his behalf to his lady and begged of her that it might be her good pleasure to permit herself to be seen by her enslaved knight and deign to bestow her blessing upon him so that he might thereby hope for a happy issue in all his encounters and difficult enterprises sancho undertook to execute the task according to the instructions and to bring back an answer as good as the one he brought back before go my son said don quixote and be not dazed when thou findest thyself exposed to the light of that sun of beauty thou art going to seek happy thou above all the squires in the world bear in mind and let it not escape thy memory how she receives thee if she changes colour while thou art giving her my message if she is agitated and disturbed at hearing my name if she cannot rest upon her cushion shouldst thou haply find her seated in the sumptuous state chamber proper to her rank and should she be standing observe if she poises herself now on one foot now on the other if she repeats two or three times the reply she gives thee if she passes from gentleness to austerity from asperity to tenderness if she raises her hand to smooth her hair though it be not disarranged in short my son observe all her actions and motions for if thou wilt report them to me as they were i will gather what she hides in the recesses of her heart as regards my love for i would have thee know sancho if thou knowest it not that with lovers the outward actions and motions they give way to when their loves are in question are the faithful messengers that carry the news of what is going on in the depths of their hearts go my friend may better fortune than mine attend thee and bring thee a happier issue than that which i await in dread in this dreary solitude i will go and return quickly said sancho cheer up that little heart of yours master mine for at the present moment you seem to have got one no bigger than a hazelnut remember what they say that a stout heart breaks bad luck and that where there are no fletches there are no pegs and moreover they say the hair jumps up where it's not looked for i say this because if we could not find my lady's palaces or castles to-night now that it is daylight i count upon finding them when i least expect it and once found leave it to me to manage her verily sancho said don quixote thou dost always bring in thy proverbs happily whatever we deal with may god give me better luck in what i am anxious about with this sancho wheeled about and gave dapple the stick and don quixote remained behind seated on his horse resting in his stirrups and leaning on the end of his lance filled with sad and troubled forebodings and there we will leave him and accompany sancho who went off no less serious and troubled than he left his master so much so that as soon as he had got out of the thicket and looking round saw that don quixote was not within sight he dismounted from his ass and seating himself at the foot of a tree began to commune with himself saying now brother sancho 
let us know where your worship is going are you going to look for some ass that has been lost not at all then what are you going to look for i am going to look for a princess that's all and in her for the sun of beauty and the whole heaven at once and where do you expect to find all this sancho where why in the great city of el toboso well and for whom are you going to look for her for the famous knight don quixote of la mancha who rights wrongs gives food to those who thirst and drink to the hungry that's all very well but do you know her house sancho my master says it will be some royal palace or grand castle and have you ever seen her by any chance neither i nor my master ever saw her and does it strike you that it would be just and right if the el toboso people finding out that you were here with the intention of going to tamper with their princesses and trouble their ladies were to come and cudgel your ribs and not leave a whole bone in you they would indeed have very good reason if they did not see that i am under orders and that you are a messenger my friend no blame belongs to you don't you trust to that sancho for the manchegan folk are as hot-tempered as they are honest and won't put up with liberties from anybody by the lord if they get scent of you it will be worse for you i promise you be off you scoundrel let the bolt fall why should i go looking for three feet on a cat to please another man and what is more when looking for dulcinea will be looking for marica in ravenna or the bachelor in salamanca the devil the devil and nobody else has mixed me up in this business such was the soliloquy sancho held with himself and all the conclusion he could come to was to say to himself again well there's remedy for everything except death under whose yoke we have all to pass whether we like it or not when life's finished i have seen by a thousand signs that this master of mine is a madman fit to be tied and for that matter i too am not behind him for i am a greater fool than he is when i follow him and serve him if there's any truth in the proverb that says tell me what company thou keepest and i'll tell thee what thou art or in that other not with whom thou art bred but with whom thou art fed well then if he be mad as he is and with a madness that mostly takes one thing for another and white for black and black for white as was seen when he said the windmills were giants and the monks mules dromedaries flocks of sheep armies of enemies and much more to the same tune it will not be very hard to make him believe that some country girl the first i come across here is the lady dulcinea and if he does not believe it i'll swear it and if he should swear i'll swear again and if he persists i'll persist still more so as come what may to have my quoit always over the peg maybe by holding out in this way i may put a stop to his sending me on messages of this kind another time or maybe he will think as i suspect he will that one of those wicked enchanters who he says have a spite against him has changed her form for the sake of doing him an ill turn and injuring him with this reflection sancho made his mind easy counting the business as good as settled and stayed there till the afternoon so as to make don quixote think he had time enough to go to el toboso and return and things turned out so luckily for him that as he got up to mount dapple he spied coming from el toboso towards the spot where he stood three peasant girls on three colts or fillies for the author does not make the point clear though it is more likely they were she asses the usual mount with village girls but as it is of no great consequence we need not stop to prove it to be brief the instant sancho saw the peasant girls he returned full speed to seek his master and found him sighing and uttering a thousand passionate lamentations when don quixote saw him he exclaimed what news sancho my friend am i to mark this day with a white stone or a black your worship replied sancho had better mark it with ruddle like the inscriptions on the walls of classrooms that those who see it may see it plain then thou bringest good news said don quixote so good replied sancho that your worship has only to spur rocinante and get out into the open field to see the lady dulcinea del toboso who with two others damsels of hers is coming to see your worship holy god what art thou saying sancho my friend exclaimed don quixote take care thou art not deceiving me or seeking by false joy to cheer my real sadness what could i get by deceiving your worship returned sancho especially when it will so soon be shown whether i tell the truth or not come senor push on and you will see the princess our mistress coming robed and adorned in fact like what she is her damsels and she are all one glow of gold all bunches of pearls all diamonds all rubies all cloth of brocade of more than ten borders with their hair loose on their shoulders like so many sunbeams playing with the wind 
and moreover they come mounted on three piebald cackneys the finest sight ever you saw hackneys you mean sancho said don quixote there is not much difference between cackneys and hackneys said sancho but no matter what they come on there they are the finest ladies one could wish for especially my lady the princess dulcinea who staggers one's senses let us go sancho my son said don quixote and in guerdon of this news as unexpected as it is good i bestow upon thee the best spoil i shall win in the first adventure i may have or if that does not satisfy thee i promise thee the foals i shall have this year from my three mares that thou knowest are in foal on our village common i'll take the foals said sancho for it is not quite certain that the spoils of the first adventure will be good ones by this time they had cleared the wood and saw the three village lasses close at hand don quixote looked all along the road to el toboso and as he could see nobody except the three peasant girls he was completely puzzled and asked sancho if it was outside the city he had left them how outside the city returned sancho are your worship's eyes in the back of your head that you can't see that they are these who are coming here shining like the very sun at noonday i see nothing sancho said don quixote but three country girls on three jackasses now may god deliver me from the devil said sancho and can it be that your worship takes three hackneys or whatever they're called as white as the driven snow for jackasses by the lord i could tear my beard if that was the case well i can only say sancho my friend said don quixote that it is as plain they are jackasses or jennyasses as that i am don quixote and thou sancho panza at any rate they seem to me to be so hush senor said sancho don't talk that way but open your eyes and come and pay your respects to the lady of your thoughts who is close upon us now and with these words he advanced to receive the three village lasses and dismounting from dapple caught hold of one of the asses of the three country girls by the halter and dropping on both knees on the ground he said queen and princess and duchess of beauty may it please your haughtiness and greatness to receive into your favour and good will your captive knight who stands there turned into marble stone and quite stupefied and benumbed at finding himself in your magnificent presence i am sancho panza his squire and he the vagabond knight don quixote of la mancha otherwise called the knight of the rueful countenance don quixote had by this time placed himself on his knees beside sancho and with eyes starting out of his head and a puzzled gaze was regarding her whom sancho called queen and lady and as he could see nothing in her except a village lass and not a very well-favoured one for she was platter-faced and snub-nosed he was perplexed and bewildered and did not venture to open his lips the country girls at the same time were astonished to see these two men so different in appearance on their knees preventing their companion from going on she however who had been stopped breaking silence said angrily and testily get out of the way bad luck to you and let us pass for we are in a hurry to which sancho returned o oh, princess and universal lady of el toboso is not your magnanimous heart softened by seeing the pillar and prop of knight errantry on his knees before your sublimated presence on hearing this one of the others exclaimed woe then why i am rubbing thee down she asked of my father-in-law see how the lordlings come to make game of the village girls now as if we here could not chaff as well as themselves go your own way and let us go ours and it will be better for you get up sancho said don quixote at this i see that fortune with evil done to me unsated still has taken possession of all the roads by which any comfort may reach this wretched soul that i carry in my flesh and thou highest perfection of excellence that can be desired utmost limit of grace in human shape sole relief of this afflicted heart that adores thee though the malign enchanter that persecutes me has brought clouds and cataracts on my eyes and to them and them only transform thy unparagoned beauty and change thy features into those of a poor peasant girl if so be he has not at the same time changed mine into those of some monster to render them loathsome in thy sight refuse not to look upon me with tenderness and love seeing in this submission that i make on my knees to thy transformed beauty the humility with which my soul adores thee <laughs> heyday my grandfather cried the girl much i care for your love-making get out of the way and let us pass and we'll thank you 
Sancho stood aside and let her go, very well pleased to have got so well out of the hobble he was in. The instant the village lass who had done duty for Dulcinea found herself free, prodding her cackney with the spike she had at the end of a stick, she set off at full speed across the field. The she-ass, however, feeling the point more acutely than usual, began cutting such capers that it flung the lady Dulcinea to the ground, seeing which Don Quixote ran to raise her up, and Sancho to fix and girth the pack-saddle, which also had slipped under the ass's belly. The pack-saddle being secured, as Don Quixote was about to lift up his enchanted mistress in his arms and put her upon her beast, the lady, getting up from the ground, saved him the trouble. For going back a little she took a short run, and putting both hands on the croup of the ass, she dropped into the saddle more lightly than a falcon, and sat astride like a man, whereat Sancho said, Rogue? But our lady is lighter than a lanner, and might teach the cleverest Cordovan or Mexican how to mount. She cleared the back of the saddle in one jump, and without spurs she is making the hackney go like a zebra, and her damsels are no way behind her, for they all fly like the wind. Which was the truth, for as soon as they saw Dulcinea mounted, they pushed on after her, and sped away without looking back for more than half a league. Don Quixote followed them with his eyes, and when they were no longer in sight he turned to Sancho and said, how now sancho thou seest how i am hated by enchanters and see to what a length the malice and spite they bear me go when they seek to deprive me of the happiness it would give me to see my lady in her own proper form the fact is i was born to be an example of misfortune and the target and mark at which the arrows of adversity are aimed and directed observe too sancho that these traitors were not content with changing and transforming my dulcinea but they transformed and changed her into a shape as mean and ill-favoured as that of the village girl yonder and at the same time they robbed her of that which is such a peculiar property of ladies of distinction that is to say the sweet fragrance that comes of being always among perfumes and flowers for i must tell thee sancho that when i approached to put dulcinea upon her hackney as thou sayest it was though to me it appeared a she-ass she gave me a whiff of raw garlic that made my head reel and poisoned my very heart oh scum of the earth cried sancho at this oh miserable spiteful enchanters oh that i could see you all strung by the gills like sardines on a twig ye know a great deal ye can do a great deal and ye do a great deal more it ought to have been enough for you ye scoundrels to have changed the pearls of my lady's eyes into oak galls and her hair of purest gold into the bristles of a red ox's tail and in short all her features from fair to foul without meddling with her smell for by that we might somehow have found out what was hidden underneath that ugly rind though to tell the truth i never perceived her ugliness but only her beauty which was raised to the highest pitch of perfection by a mole she had on her right lip like a moustache with seven or eight red hairs like threads of gold and more than a palm long from the correspondence which exists between those of the face and those of the body said don quixote dulcinea must have another mole resembling that on the thick of the thigh on that side on which she has the one on her face but hairs of the length thou hast mentioned are very long for moles well all i can say is there they were as plain as could be replied sancho i believe it my friend returned don quixote for nature bestowed nothing on Dulcinea that was not perfect and well finished. And so if she had a hundred moles like the one thou hast described, in her they would not be moles, but moons and shining stars. But tell me, Sancho, that which seemed to me to be a pack-saddle, as thou wert fixing it, was it a flat saddle or a side saddle? It was neither, replied Sancho, but a hineta saddle, with a field covering worth half a kingdom, so rich is it and that i could not see all this sancho said don quixote once more i say and will say a thousand times i am the most unfortunate of men sancho the rogue had enough to do to hide his laughter at hearing the simplicity of the master he had so nicely befooled at length after a good deal more conversation had passed between them they remounted their beasts and followed the road to saragossa which they expected to reach in time to take part in a certain grand festival which is held every year in that illustrious city but before they got there things happened to them so many so important and so strange that they deserve to be recorded and read as will be seen farther on end of volume two part two chapter ten recording by expatriate in bangor maine
Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Eleven, of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Eleven, of the Strange Adventure which the Valiant Don Quixote had with the car or cart of the cortes of death dejected beyond measure did don quixote pursue his journey turning over in his mind the cruel trick the enchanters had played him in changing his lady dulcinea into the vile shape of the village lass nor could he think of any way of restoring her to her original form and these reflections so absorbed him that without being aware of it he let go rocinante's bridle and he perceiving the liberty that was granted him stopped at every step to crop the fresh grass with which the plain abounded sancho recalled him from his reverie melancholy senor said he was made not for beasts but for men but if men give way to it overmuch they turn to beasts control yourself your worship be yourself again gather up rocinante's reins cheer up rouse yourself and show that gallant spirit that knights errant ought to have what the devil is this what weakness is this are we here or in france the devil fly away with all the dulcineas in the world for the well-being of a single knight errant is of more consequence than all the enchantments and transformations on earth hush sancho said don quixote in a weak and faint voice hush and utter no blasphemies against that enchanted lady for i alone am to blame for her misfortune and hard fate her calamity has come of the hatred the wicked bear me so say i returned sancho his heart rend in twain i trow who saw her once to see her now thou mayest well say that sancho replied don quixote as thou sawest her in the full perfection of her beauty for the enchantment does not go so far as to pervert thy vision or hide her loveliness from thee against me alone and against my eyes is the strength of its venom directed nevertheless there is one thing which has occurred to me and that is that thou didst ill describe her beauty to me for as well as i recollect thou saidst that her eyes were pearls but eyes that are like pearls are rather the eyes of a sea bream than of a lady and i am persuaded that dulcinea's must be green emeralds full and soft with two rainbows for eyebrows take away those pearls from her eyes and transfer them to her teeth for beyond a doubt sancho thou hast taken the one for the other the eyes for the teeth very likely said sancho for her beauty bewildered me as much as her ugliness did your worship but let us leave it all to god who alone knows what is to happen in this vale of tears in this evil world of ours where there is hardly a thing to be found without some mixture of wickedness roguery and rascality but one thing senor troubles me more than all the rest and that is thinking what is to be done when your worship conquers some giant or some other knight and orders him to go and present himself before the beauty of the lady dulcinea where is this poor giant or this poor wretch of a vanquished knight to find her i think i can see them wandering all over el toboso looking like noddies and asking for my lady dulcinea and even if they meet her in the middle of the street they won't know her any more than they would my father perhaps sancho returned don quixote the enchantment does not go so far as to deprive conquered and presented giants and knights of the power of recognizing dulcinea we will try by experiment with one or two of the first i vanquish and send to her whether they see her or not by commanding them to return and give me an account of what happened to them in this respect i declare i think what your worship has proposed is excellent said sancho and that by this plan we shall find out what we want to know and if it be that it is only from your worship she is hidden the misfortune will be more yours than hers but so long as the lady dulcinea is well and happy we on our part will make the best of it and get on as well as we can seeking our adventures and leaving time to take his own course for he is the best physician for these and greater ailments don quixote was about to reply to sancho panza but he was prevented by a cart crossing the road full of the most diverse and strange personages and figures that could be imagined he who led the mules and acted as carter was a hideous demon the cart was open to the sky without a tilt or cane roof and the first figure that presented itself to don quixote's eyes 
was that of death itself with a human face next to it was an angel with large painted wings and at one side an emperor with a crown to all appearance of gold on his head at the feet of death was the god called cupid without his bandage but with his bow quiver and arrows there was also a knight in full armour except that he had no morion or helmet but only a hat decked with plumes of diverse colours and along with these there were others with a variety of costumes and faces all this unexpectedly encountered took don quixote somewhat aback and struck terror into the heart of sancho but the next instant don quixote was glad of it believing that some new perilous adventure was presenting itself to him and under this impression and with a spirit prepared to face any danger he planted himself in front of the car and in a loud and menacing tone exclaimed carter or coachman or devil or whatever thou art tell me at once who thou art whither thou art going and who these folk are thou carriest in thy wagon which looks more like charon's boat than an ordinary cart to which the devil stopping the cart answered quietly senor we are players of anjulo el malo's company we have been acting the play of the cortez of death this morning which is the octave of corpus christi in a village behind that hill and we have to act it this afternoon in that village which you can see from this and as it is so near and to save the trouble of undressing and dressing again we go in the costumes in which we perform that lad there appears as death that other as an angel that woman the manager's wife plays the queen this one the soldier that the emperor and i the devil and i am one of the principal characters of the play for in this company i take the leading parts if you want to know anything more about us ask me and i will answer with the utmost exactitude for as i am a devil i am up to everything by the faith of a knight-errant replied don quixote when i saw this cart i fancied some great adventure was presenting itself to me but i declare one must touch with the hand what appears to the eye if illusions are to be avoided god speed you good people keep your festival and remember if you demand of me aught wherein i can render you a service i will do it gladly and willingly for from a child i was fond of the play and in my youth a keen lover of the actor's art while they were talking fate so willed it that one of the company in a mummer's dress with a great number of bells and armed with three blown ox-bladders at the end of a stick joined them and this merry andrew approaching don quixote began flourishing his stick and banging the ground with the bladders and cutting capers with great jingling of the bells which untoward apparition so startled rocinante that in spite of don quixote's efforts to hold him in taking the bit between his teeth he set off across the plain with greater speed than the bones of his anatomy ever gave any promise of sancho who thought his master was in danger of being thrown jumped off dapple and ran in all haste to help him but by the time he reached him he was already on the ground and beside him was rocinante who had come down with his master the usual end and upshot of rocinante's vivacity and high spirits but the moment sancho quitted his beast to go and help don quixote the dancing devil with the bladders jumped up on dapple and beating him with them more by the fright and the noise than by the pain of the blows made him fly across the fields towards the village where they were going to hold their festival sancho witnessed dapple's career and his master's fall and did not know which of the two cases of need he should attend to first but in the end like a good squire and good servant he let his love for his master prevail over his affection for his ass though every time he saw the bladders rise in the air and come down on the hind quarters of his dapple he felt the pains and terrors of death and he would have rather had the blows fall on the apples of his own eyes than on the least hair of his ass's tail in this trouble and perplexity he came to where don quixote lay in a far sorrier plight than he liked and having helped him to mount rocinante he said to him senor the devil has carried off my dapple what devil asked don quixote the one with the bladders said sancho then i will recover him said don quixote even if he be shut up with him in the deepest and darkest dungeons of hell follow me sancho for the cart goes slowly and with the mules of it i will make good the loss of dapple you need not take the trouble senor said sancho keep cool for as i now see the devil has let dapple go and he is coming back to his old quarters and so it turned out for having come down with dapple in imitation of don quixote and rocinante the devil made off on foot to the town and the ass came back to its master 
for all that said don quixote it will be well to visit the discourtesy of that devil upon some of those in the cart even if it were the emperor himself don't think of it your worship returned sancho take my advice and never meddle with actors for they are a favoured class i myself have known an actor taken up for two murders and yet come off scot-free remember that as they are merry folk who give pleasure every one favours and protects them and helps and makes much of them above all when they are those of the royal companies and under patent all or most of whom in dress and appearance look like princes still for all that said don quixote the player devil must not go off boasting even if the whole human race favours him so saying he made for the cart which was now very near the town shouting out as he went stay halt ye merry jovial crew i want to teach you how to treat asses and animals that serve the squires of knights-errant for steeds so loud were the shouts of don quixote that those in the cart heard and understood them and guessing by the words what the speaker's intention was death in an instant jumped out of the cart and the emperor the devil carter and the angel after him nor did the queen or the god cupid stay behind and all armed themselves with stones and formed in line prepared to receive don quixote on the points of their pebbles don quixote when he saw them drawn up in such a gallant array with uplifted arms ready for a mighty discharge of stones checked rocinante and began to consider in what way he could attack them with the least danger to himself as he halted sancho came up and seeing him disposed to attack this well-ordered squadron said to him it would be the height of madness to attempt such an enterprise remember senor that against sops from the brook and plenty of them there is no defensive armour in the world except to stow oneself away under a brass bell and besides one should remember that it is rashness and not valour for a single man to attack an army that has death in it and where emperors fight in person with angels good and bad to help them and if this reflection will not make you keep quiet perhaps it will to know for certain that among all these though they look like kings princes and emperors there is not a single knight-errant now indeed thou hast hit the point sancho said don quixote which may and should turn me from the resolution i had already formed i cannot and must not draw a sword as i have many a time before told thee against any one who is not a dubbed knight it is for thee sancho if thou wilt to take vengeance for the wrong done to thy dapple and i will help thee from here by shouts and salutary counsels there is no occasion to take vengeance on any one senor replied sancho for it is not the part of good christians to revenge wrongs and besides i will arrange it with my ass to leave his grievance to my good will and pleasure and that is to live in peace as long as heaven grants me life well said don quixote if that be thy determination good sancho sensible sancho christian sancho honest sancho let us leave these phantoms alone and turn to the pursuit of better and worthier adventures for from what i see of this country we cannot fail to find plenty of marvellous ones in it he at once wheeled about sancho ran to take possession of his dapple death and his flying squadron returned to their cart and pursued their journey and thus the dread adventure of the cart of death ended happily thanks to the advice sancho gave his master who had the following day a fresh adventure of no less thrilling interest than the last with an enamoured knight-errant end of volume two part two chapter eleven recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twelve of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter twelve of the strange adventure which befell the valiant don quixote with the bold knight of the mirrors the night succeeding the day of the encounter with death don quixote and his squire passed under some tall shady trees and don quixote at sancho's persuasion ate a little from the store carried by dapple and over their supper sancho said to his master senor what a fool i should have looked if i had chosen for my reward the spoils of the first adventure your worship achieved instead of the folds of the three mares after all a sparrow in the hand is better than a vulture on the wing 
at the same time sancho replied don quixote if thou hadst let me attack them as i wanted at the very least the emperor's gold crown and cupid's painted wings would have fallen to thee as spoils for i should have taken them by force and given them into thy hands the sceptres and crowns of those play-actor emperors said sancho were never yet pure gold but only brass foil or tin that is true said don quixote for it would not be right that the accessories of the drama should be real instead of being mere fictions and semblances like the drama itself towards which sancho and as a necessary consequence towards those who represent and produce it i would that thou wert favourably disposed for they are all instruments of great good to the state placing before us at every step a mirror in which we may see vividly displayed what goes on in human life nor is there any similitude that shows us more faithfully what we are and ought to be than the play and the players come tell me hast thou not seen a play acted in which kings emperors pontiffs knights ladies and diverse other personages were introduced one plays the villain another the knave this one the merchant that the soldier one the sharp-witted fool another the foolish lover and when the play is over and they have put off the dresses they wore in it all the actors become equal yes i have seen that said sancho well then said don quixote the same thing happens in the comedy and life of this world where some play emperors others popes and in short all the characters that can be brought into a play but when it is over that is to say when life ends death strips them of all the garments that distinguish one from the other and all are equal in the grave a fine comparison said sancho though not so new but that i have heard it many and many a time as well as that other one of the game of chess how so long as the game lasts each piece has its own particular office and when the game is finished they are all mixed jumbled up and shaken together and stowed away in the bag which is much like ending life in the grave thou art growing less doltish and more shrewd every day sancho said don quixote ay said sancho it must be that some of your worship's shrewdness sticks to me land that of itself is barren and dry will come to yield good fruit if you dung it and till it what i mean is that your worship's conversation has been the dung that has fallen on the barren soil of my dry wit and the time i have been in your service and society has been the tillage and with the help of this i hope to yield fruit in abundance that will not fall away or slide from those paths of good breeding that your worship has made in my parched understanding don quixote laughed at sancho's affected phraseology and perceived that what he said about his improvement was true for now and then he spoke in a way that surprised him though always or mostly when sancho tried to talk fine and attempted polite language he wound up by toppling over from the summit of his simplicity into the abyss of his ignorance and where he showed his culture and his memory to the greatest advantage was in dragging in proverbs no matter whether they had any bearing or not upon the subject in hand as may have been seen already and will be noticed in the course of this history in conversation of this kind they passed a good part of the night but sancho felt a desire to let down the curtains of his eyes as he used to say when he wanted to go to sleep and stripping dapple he left him at liberty to graze his fill he did not remove rocinante's saddle as his master's express orders were that so long as they were in the field or not sleeping under a roof rocinante was not to be stripped the ancient usage established and observed by knights errant being to take off the bridle and hang it on the saddle-bow but to remove the saddle from the horse never sancho acted accordingly and gave him the same liberty he had given dapple between whom and rocinante there was a friendship so unequalled and so strong that it is handed down by tradition from father to son that the author of this veracious history devoted some special chapters to it which in order to preserve the propriety and decorum due to a history so heroic he did not insert therein although at times he forgets this resolution of his and describes how eagerly the two beasts would scratch one another when they were together and how when they were tired or full rocinante would lay his neck across dapples stretching half a yard or more on the other side and the pair would stand thus gazing thoughtfully on the ground for three days or at least so long as they were left alone or hunger did not drive them to go and look for food i may add that they say the author left it on record that he likened their friendship to that of nisus and euryalus 
and pylades and orestes and if that be so it may be perceived to the admiration of mankind how firm the friendship must have been between these two peaceful animals shaming men who preserve friendships with one another so badly this was why it was said for friend no longer is their friend the reeds turn lances now and someone else has sung friend to friend the bug etc and let no one fancy that the author was at all astray when he compared the friendship of these animals to that of men for men have received many lessons from beasts and learned many important things as for example the cloister from the stork vomit and gratitude from the dog watchfulness from the crane foresight from the ant modesty from the elephant and loyalty from the horse sancho at last fell asleep at the foot of a cork tree while don quixote dozed at that of a sturdy oak but a short time only had elapsed when a noise he heard behind him awoke him and rising up startled he listened and looked in the direction the noise came from and perceived two men on horseback one of whom letting himself drop from the saddle said to the other dismount my friend and take the bridles off the horses for so far as i can see this place will furnish grass for them and the solitude and silence my lovesick thoughts need of as he said this he stretched himself upon the ground and as he flung himself down the armour in which he was clad rattled whereby don quixote perceived that he must be a knight-errant and going over to sancho who was asleep he shook him by the arm and with no small difficulty brought him back to his senses and said in a low voice to him brother sancho we have got an adventure god send us a good one said sancho and where may her ladyship the adventure be where sancho replied don quixote turn thine eyes and look and thou wilt see stretched there a knight-errant who it strikes me is not over and above happy for i saw him fling himself off his horse and throw himself on the ground with a certain air of dejection and his armour rattled as he fell well said sancho how does your worship make out that to be an adventure i do not mean to say returned don quixote that it is a complete adventure but that it is the beginning of one for it is in this way adventures begin but listen for it seems he is tuning a lute or guitar and from the way he is spitting and clearing his chest he must be getting ready to sing something faith you are right said sancho and no doubt he is some enamoured knight there is no knight-errant that is not said don quixote but let us listen to him for if he sings by that thread we shall extract the ball of his thoughts because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh sancho was about to reply to his master but the knight of the grove's voice which was neither very bad nor very good stopped him and listening attentively the pair heard him sing this sonnet your pleasure prithee lady mine unfold declare the terms that i am to obey my will to yours submissively i mould and from your law my feet shall never stray would you i die to silent grief a prey then count me even now as dead and cold would you i tell my woes in some new way then shall my tale by love itself be told the unison of opposites to prove of the soft wax and diamond hard am i but still obedient to the laws of love here hard or soft i offer you my breast whate'er you grave or stamp thereon shall rest indelible for all eternity with an ah me that seemed to be drawn from the inmost recesses of his heart the knight of the grove brought his lay to an end and shortly afterwards exclaimed in a melancholy and piteous voice o oh, fairest and most ungrateful woman on earth what can it be most serene casildea de vandalia that thou wilt suffer this thy captive knight to waste away and perish in ceaseless wanderings and rude and arduous toils it is not enough that i have compelled all the knights of navarre all the leonese all the tartesians all the castilians and finally all the knights of la mancha to confess thee the most beautiful in the world not so said don quixote at this for i am of la mancha and i have never confessed anything of the sort nor could i nor should i confess a thing so much to the prejudice of my lady's beauty thou seest how this knight is raving sancho but let us listen perhaps he will tell us more about himself that he will return sancho for he seems in a mood to bewail himself for a month at a stretch 
but this was not the case for the knight of the grove hearing voices near him instead of continuing his lamentation stood up and exclaimed in a distinct but courteous tone who goes there what are you do you belong to the number of the happy or of the miserable of the miserable answered don quixote then come to me said he of the grove and rest assured that it is to woe itself and affliction itself you come don quixote finding himself answered in such a soft and courteous manner went over to him and so did sancho the doleful knight took don quixote by the arm saying sit down here sir knight for that you are one and of those that profess knight-errantry it is to me a sufficient proof to have found you in this place where solitude and night the natural couch and proper retreat of knights-errant keep you company to which don made answer a knight i am of the profession you mention and though sorrows misfortunes and calamities have made my heart their abode the compassion i feel for the misfortunes of others has not been thereby banished from it from what you have just now sung i gather that yours spring from love i mean from the love you bear that fair ingrate you named in your lament in the meantime they had seated themselves together on the hard ground peaceably and sociably just as if as soon as day broke they were not going to break one another's heads are you sir knight in love perchance asked he of the grove of don quixote by mischance i am replied don quixote though the ills arising from well-bestowed affections should be esteemed favours rather than misfortunes that is true returned he of the grove if scorn did not unsettle our reason and understanding for if it be excessive it looks like revenge i was never scorned by my lady said don quixote certainly not said sancho who stood close by for my lady is as a lamb and softer than a roll of butter is this your squire asked he of the grove he is said don quixote i never yet saw a squire said he of the grove who ventured to speak when his master was speaking at least there is mine who is as big as his father and it cannot be proved that he has ever opened his lips when i am speaking by my faith then said sancho i have spoken and am fit to speak in the presence of one as much or even but never mind it only makes it worse to stir it the squire of the grove took sancho by the arm saying to him let us two go where we can talk in squire style as much as we please and leave these gentlemen our masters to fight it out over the story of their loves and depend upon it daybreak will find them at it without having made an end of it so be it by all means said sancho and i will tell your worship who i am that you may see whether i am to be reckoned among the number of the most talkative squires with this the two squires withdrew to one side and between them there passed a conversation as droll as that which passed between their masters was serious end of volume two part two chapter twelve recording by expatriate in bangor maine Volume two, part two, chapter thirteen of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter thirteen, in which is continued the adventure of the Knight of the Grove together with the sensible original and tranquil colloquy that passed between the two squires the knights and the squires made two parties these telling the story of their lives the others the story of their loves but the history relates first of all the conversation of the servants and afterwards takes up that of the masters and it says that withdrawing a little from the others he of the grove said to sancho a hard life it is we lead and live senor we that are squires to knights errant verily we eat our bread in the sweat of our faces which is one of the curses god laid on our first parents it may be said too added sancho that we eat it in the chill of our bodies for who gets more heat and cold than the miserable squires of knight errantry even so it would not be so bad if we had something to eat for woes are lighter if there is bread but sometimes we go a day or two without breaking our fast except with the wind that blows all that said he of the grove may be endured and put up with when we had hopes of reward for unless the knight-errant he serves is excessively unlucky 
after a few turns the squire will at least find himself rewarded with a fine government of some island or some fair county i said sancho have already told my master that i shall be content with the government of some island and he is so noble and generous that he has promised it to me ever so many times i said he of the grove shall be satisfied with a canonry for my services and my master has already assigned me one oh your master said sancho no doubt is a knight in the church line and can bestow rewards of that sort on his good squire but mine is only a layman though i remember some clever but to my mind designing people strove to persuade him to try and become an archbishop he however would not be anything but an emperor but i was trembling all the time lest he should take a fancy to go into the church not finding myself fit to hold office in it for i may tell you though i seem a man i am no better than a beast for the church well then you are wrong there said he of the grove for those island governments are not all satisfactory some are awkward some are poor some are dull and in short the highest and choicest brings with it a heavy burden of cares and troubles which the unhappy wight to whose lot it has fallen bears upon his shoulders far better would it be for us who have adopted this accursed service to go back to our own houses and there employ ourselves in pleasanter occupations in hunting or fishing for instance for what squire in the world is there so poor as not to have a hack and a couple of greyhounds and a fishing rod to amuse himself with in his own village i am not in want of any of those things said sancho to be sure i have no hack but i have an ass that is worth my master's horse twice over god send me a bad easter and that the next one i am to see if i would swap even if i got four bushels of barley to boot you will laugh at the value i put on my dapple for dapple is the colour of my beast as to greyhounds i can't want for them for there are enough and to spare in my town and moreover there is more pleasure in sport when it is at other people's expense in truth and earnest sir squire said he of the grove i have made up my mind and determined to have done with these drunken vagaries of these knights and go back to my village and bring up my children for i have three like three oriental pearls i have two said sancho that might be presented before the pope himself especially a girl whom i am breeding up for a countess please god though in spite of her mother and how old is this lady that is being bred up for a countess asked he of the grove fifteen a couple of years more or less answered sancho but she is as tall as a lance and as fresh as an april morning and as strong as a porter those are gifts to fit her to be not only a countess but a nymph of the greenwood said he of the grove horse and strumpet what pith the rogue must have to which sancho made answer somewhat sulkily she's no strumpet nor was her mother nor will either of them be please god while i live speak more civilly for one bred up among knights errant to our courtesy itself your words don't seem to me to be very becoming oh how little you know about compliments sir squire returned he of the grove what don't you know that when a horseman delivers a good lance thrust at the bull in the plaza or when any one does anything very well the people are wont to say ha ah, horse and rip how well he has done it and that what seems to be abuse in the expression is high praise disowned sons and daughters senor who don't do what deserves that compliments of this sort should be paid to their parents i do disown them replied sancho and in this way and by the same reasoning you might call me and my children and my wife all the strumpets in the world for all they do and say is of a kind that in the highest degree deserves the same praise and to see them again i pray god to deliver me from mortal sin or what comes to the same thing to deliver me from this perilous calling of squire into which i have fallen for a second time decayed and beguiled by a purse with a hundred ducats that i found one day in the heart of the sierra morena and the devil is always putting a bag full of doubloons before my eyes here there everywhere until i fancy at every step i am putting my hand on it and hugging it and carrying it home with me and making investments and getting interest and living like a prince and so long as i think of this i make light of all the hardships i endure with this simpleton of a master of mine who i well know is more of a madman than a knight there is why they say that covetousness bursts the bag said he of the grove but if you come to talk of that sort there is not a greater one in the world than my master for he is one of those of whom they say the cares of others kill the ass for in order that another knight may recover the senses he has lost he makes a madman of himself and goes looking for what when found may for all i know fly in his own face and is he in love perchance asked sancho 
he is said he of the grove with one casildia de vandalia the rawest and best roasted lady the whole world could produce but that rawness is not the only foot he limps on for he has greater schemes rumbling in his bowels as will be seen before many hours are over there's no road so smooth but it has some hole or hindrance in it said sancho in other houses they cook beans but in mine it's by the potful madness will have more followers and hangers-on than sound sense but if there be any truth in the common saying that to have companions in trouble gives some relief i may take consolation from you inasmuch as you serve a master as crazy as my own crazy but valiant replied he of the grove and more roguish than crazy or valiant mine is not that said sancho i mean he has nothing of the rogue in him on the contrary he is the soul of a pitcher he has no thought of doing harm to any one only good to all nor has he any malice whatever in him a child might persuade him that it is night at noonday and for this simplicity i love him as the core of my heart and i can't bring myself to leave him let him do ever such foolish things for all that brother and senor said he of the grove if the blind lead the blind both are in danger of falling into the pit it is better for us to beat a quiet retreat and get back to our own quarters for those who seek adventures don't always find good ones sancho kept spitting from time to time and his spittle seemed somewhat ropey and dry observing which the compassionate squire of the grove said it seems to me that with all this talk of ours our tongues are sticking to the roofs of our mouths but i have a pretty good loosener hanging from the saddle-bow of my horse and getting up he came back the next minute with a large bota of wine and a pasty half a yard across and this is no exaggeration for it was made of a house rabbit so big that sancho as he handled it took it to be made of a goat not to say a kid and looking at it he said and do you carry this with you senor why what are you thinking about said the other do you take me for some paltry squire i carry a better larder on my horse's croup than a general takes with him when he goes on a march sancho ate without requiring to be pressed and in the dark bolted mouthfuls like the knots on a tether and said he you are a proper trusty squire one of the right sort sumptuous and grand as this banquet shows which if it has not come here by magic art at any rate has the look of it not like me unlucky beggar that have nothing more in my alforjas than a scrap of cheese so hard that one might brain a giant with it and to keep a company a few dozen carobs and as many more filberts and walnuts thanks to the austerity of my master and the idea he has and the rule he follows the knights errant must not live or sustain themselves on anything except dried fruits and the herbs of the field by my faith brother said he of the grove my stomach is not made for thistles or wild pears or roots of the woods let our masters do as they like with their chivalry notions and laws and eat what those enjoin i carry my prog basket and this bota hanging to the saddle-bow whatever they may say and it is such an object of worship with me and i love it so that there is hardly a moment but i am kissing and embracing it over and over again and so saying he thrust it into sancho's hands who raising it aloft pointed it to his mouth gazed at the stars for a quarter of an hour and when he had done drinking let his head fall on one side and giving a deep sigh exclaimed ah horse and rogue how catholic it is there you see said he of the grove hearing sancho's exclamation how you have called this wine horson by way of praise well said sancho i own it and i grant it is no dishonour to call any one horson when it is to be understood as praise but tell me senor by what you love best is this ciudad real wine oh rare wine taster said he of the grove nowhere else indeed does it come from and it has some years age too leave me alone for that said sancho never fear but i'll hit upon the place it came from somehow what would you say sir squire to my having such a great natural instinct in judging wines that you have only to let me smell one and i can tell positively its country its kind its flavour and soundness the changes it will undergo and everything that appertains to a wine but it is no wonder for i have had in my family on my father's side the two best wine tasters that have been known in la mancha for many a long year and to prove it i'll tell you now a thing that happened them they gave the two of them some wine out of a cask to try asking their opinion as to the condition quality goodness or badness of the wine one of them tried it with the tip of his tongue the other did no more than bring it to his nose the first said the wine had a flavour of iron the second said it had a stronger flavour of cordovan 
The owner said the cask was clean and that nothing had been added to the wine from which it could have got a flavor of either iron or leather. Nevertheless, these two great wine tasters held to what they had said. Time went by, the wine was sold, and when they came to clean out the cask, they found in it a small key hanging to a thong of cordovan. See now, if one who comes of the same stock has not a right to give his opinion in such like cases. Therefore I say, said he of the grove, let us give up going in quest of adventures, and as we have loaves, let us not go looking for cakes, but return to our cribs, for God will find us there if it be his will. Until my master reaches Saragossa, said Sancho, I'll remain in his service. After that, we'll see. The end of it was that the two squires talked so much and drank so much that sleep had to tie their tongues and moderate their thirst, for to quench it was impossible. And so the pair of them fell asleep, clinging to the now nearly empty bota, and with half-chewed morsels in their mouths. And there we will leave them for the present, to relate what passed between the knight of the grove and him of the rueful countenance. End of volume two, part two, chapter thirteen. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter fourteen of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter fourteen wherein is continued the adventure of the knight of the grove among the things that passed between Don Quixote and the Knight of the Wood, the history tells us he of the grove said to Don Quixote, In fine, Sir Knight, I would have you know that my destiny, or, more properly speaking, my choice, led me to fall in love with the peerless Casildea de Vandalia. I call her peerless because she has no peer, whether it be in bodily stature or in the supremacy of rank and beauty. This same Casildea, then, that I speak of, requited my honourable passion and gentle aspirations by compelling me as his stepmother did hercules to engage in many perils of various sorts at the end of each promising me that with the end of the next the object of my hopes should be attained but my labours have gone on increasing link by link until they are past counting nor do i know what will be the last one that is to be the beginning of the accomplishment of my chaste desires on one occasion she bade me go and challenge the famous giantess of seville la giralda by name who was as mighty and strong as if made of brass and though never stirring from one spot is the most restless and changeable woman in the world i came i saw i conquered and i made her stay quiet and behave herself for nothing but north winds blew for more than a week another time i was ordered to lift those ancient stones the mighty bulls of guisando an enterprise that might more fitly be entrusted to porters than to knights again she bade me fling myself into the cavern of cabra an unparalleled and awful peril and bring her a minute account of all that is concealed in those gloomy depths i stopped the motion of the heralda i lifted the bowls of guisando i flung myself into the cavern and brought to light the secrets of its abyss and my hopes are as dead as dead can be and her scorn and her commands as lively as ever to be brief last of all she has commanded me to go through all the provinces of spain and compel all the knights errant wandering therein to confess that she surpasses all women alive to-day in beauty and that i am the most valiant and the most deeply enamoured knight on earth in support of which claim i have already travelled over the greater part of spain and have there vanquished several knights who have dared to contradict me but what i most plume and pride myself upon is having vanquished in single combat that so famous knight don quixote of la mancha and made him confess that my casildea is more beautiful than his dulcinea and in this one victory i hold myself to have conquered all the knights in the world for this don quixote that i speak of has vanquished them all and i having vanquished him his glory his fame and his honour have passed and are transferred to my person for the more the vanquished hath of fair renown the greater glory gilds the victor's crown thus the innumerable achievements of the said don quixote are now set down to my account and have become mine don quixote was amazed 
when he heard the knight of the grove and was a thousand times on the point of telling him he lied and had the lie direct already on the tip of his tongue but he restrained himself as well as he could in order to force him to confess the lie with his own lips as to what you say sir knight about having vanquished most of the knights of spain or even of the whole world i say nothing but that you have vanquished don quixote of la mancha i consider doubtful it may have been some other that resembled him although there are few like him how not vanquished said he of the grove by the heaven that is above us i fought don quixote and overcame him and made him yield and he is a man of tall stature gaunt features long lank limbs with hair turning grey an aquiline nose rather hooked and large black drooping moustaches he does battle under the name of the countenance and he has for squire a peasant called sancho panza he presses the loins and rules the reins of a famous steed called rocinante and lastly he has for the mistress of his will a certain dulcinea del toboso once upon a time called aldonza lorenzo just as i call mine casodea de vandalia because her name is casilda and she is of andalusia if all these tokens are not enough to vindicate the truth of what i say here is my sword that will compel incredulity itself to give credence to it calm yourself sir knight said don quixote and give ear to what i am about to say to you i would have you know that this don quixote you speak of is the greatest friend i have in the world so much so that i may say i regard him in the same light as my own person and from the precise and clear indications you have given i cannot but think that he must be the very one you have vanquished on the other hand i see with my eyes and feel with my hands that it is impossible it can have been the same unless indeed it be that as he has many enemies who are enchanters and one in particular who is always persecuting him some one of these may have taken his shape in order to allow himself to be vanquished so as to defraud him of the fame that his exalted achievements as a knight have earned and acquired for him throughout the known world and in confirmation of this i must tell you too that it is but ten hours since these said enchanters his enemies transformed the shape and person of the fair dulcinea del toboso into a foul and mean village lass and in the same way they must have transformed don quixote and if all this does not suffice to convince you of the truth of what i say here is don quixote himself who will maintain it by arms on foot or on horseback or in any way you please and so saying he stood up and laid his hand on his sword waiting to see what the knight of the grove would do who in an equally calm voice said in reply pledges don't distress a good payer he who has succeeded in vanquishing you once when transformed sir don quixote may fairly hope to subdue you in your own proper shape but as it is not becoming for knights to perform their feats of arms in the dark like highwaymen and bullies let us wait till daylight that the sun may behold our deeds and the conditions of our combat shall be that the vanquished shall be at the victor's disposal to do all that he may enjoin provided the injunction be such as shall be becoming a knight i am more than satisfied with these conditions and terms replied don quixote and so saying they betook themselves to where their squires lay and found them snoring and in the same posture they were in when sleep fell upon them they roused them up and bade them get the horses ready as at sunrise they were to engage in a bloody and arduous single combat at which intelligence sancho was aghast and thunderstruck trembling for the safety of his master because of the mighty deeds he had heard the squire of the grove ascribe to his but without a word the two squires went in quest of their cattle for by this time the three horses and the ass had smelt one another out and were all together on the way he of the grove said to sancho you must know brother that it is the custom with the fighting men of andalusia when they are godfathers in any quarrel not to stand idle with folded arms while their godsons fight i say so to remind you that while our masters are fighting we too have to fight and knock one another to shivers that custom sir squire replied sancho may hold good among those bullies and fighting men you talk of but certainly not among the squires of knights-errant at least i have never heard my master speak of any custom of the sort and he knows all the laws of knight-errantry by heart but granting it true that there is an express law that squires are to fight while their masters are fighting i don't mean to obey it but to pay the penalty that may be laid on peacefully minded squires like myself for i am sure it cannot be more than two pounds of wax and i would rather pay that 
for I know it will cost me less than the lint I shall be at the expense of to mend my head, which I look upon as broken and split already. There's another thing that makes it impossible for me to fight, that I have no sword, for I never carried one in my life. I know a good remedy for that, said he of the grove. I have here two linen bags of the same size. You shall take one, and I the other, and we will fight at bag blows with equal arms. Oh, if that's the way, so be it with all my heart, said Sancho, for that sort of battle will serve to knock the dust out of us instead of hurting us. That will not do, said the other, for we must put into the bags, to keep the wind from blowing them away, half a dozen nice smooth pebbles, all of the same weight, and in this way we shall be able to baste one another without doing ourselves any harm or mischief body of my father said sancho see what marten and sable and pads of carded cotton he is putting into the bags that our heads may not be broken and our bones beaten to jelly but even if they are filled with tossed silk i can tell you senor i am not going to fight let our masters fight that's their lookout and let us drink and live for time will take care to ease us of our lives without our going to look for phillips so that they may be finished off before their proper time comes and they drop from ripeness still returned he of the grove we must fight if it be only for half an hour by no means said sancho i am not going to be so discourteous or so ungrateful as to have any quarrel be it ever so small with one i have eaten and drunk with besides who the devil could bring himself to fight in cold blood without anger or provocation i can remedy that entirely said he of the grove and in this way before we begin the battle, I will come up to your worship fair and softly, and give you three or four buffets, with which I shall stretch you at my feet and rouse your anger, though it were sleeping sounder than a dormouse. To match that plan, said Sancho, I have another that is not a whit behind it. I will take a cudgel, and before your worship comes near enough to waken my anger, I will send yours so sound to sleep with wax that it won't waken unless it be in the other world where it is known that i am not a man to let my face be handled by any one let each look out for the arrow though the surer way would be to let every one's anger sleep for nobody knows the heart of any one and a man may come for wool and go back shorn god gave his blessing to peace and his curse to quarrels if a hunted cat surrounded and hard pressed turns into a lion god knows what i who am a man may turn into and so from this time forth i warn you sir squire that all the harm and mischief that may come of our quarrel will be put down to your account. Very good, said he of the grove. God will send the dawn, and we shall be all right. And now gay plumaged birds of all sorts began to warble in the trees, and with their varied and gladsome notes seemed to welcome and salute the fresh morn that was beginning to show the beauty of her countenance at the gates and balconies of the east, shaking from her locks a profusion of liquid pearls, in which dulcet moisture bathed the plants too seemed to shed and shower down a pearly spray the willows distilled sweet manna the fountains laughed the brooks babbled the woods rejoiced and the meadows arrayed themselves in all their glory at her coming but hardly had the light of day made it possible to see and distinguish things when the first object that presented itself to the eyes of sancho panza was the squire of the grove's nose which was so big that it almost overshadowed his whole body it is in fact stated that it was of enormous size hooked in the middle covered with warts and of a mulberry colour like an eggplant it hung down two fingers length below his mouth and the size the colour the warts and the bend of it made his face so hideous that sancho as he looked at him began to tremble hand and foot like a child in convulsions and he vowed in his heart to let himself be given two hundred buffets sooner than be provoked to fight that monster Don Quixote examined his adversary, and found that he already had his helmet on and visor lowered, so that he could not see his face. He observed, however, that he was a sturdily built man, but not very tall in stature. Over his armor he wore a surcoat or cassock of what seemed to be the finest cloth of gold, all bespangled with glittering mirrors like little moons, which gave him an extremely gallant and splendid appearance. Above his helmet fluttered a great quantity of plumes, green, yellow, and white, and his lance, which was leaning against a tree, was very long and stout, and had a steel point more than a palm in length. Don Quixote observed all, and took note of all, and from what he saw and observed, he concluded that the said knight must be a man of great strength. But he did not for all that give way to fear, like Sancho Panza, 
on the contrary with a composed and dauntless air he said to the knight of the mirrors if sir knight your great eagerness to fight has not banished your courtesy by it i would entreat you to raise your visor a little in order that i may see if the comeliness of your countenance corresponds with that of your equipment whether you come victorious or vanquished out of this emprise sir knight replied he of the mirrors you will have more than enough time and leisure to see me and if now i do not comply with your request it is because it seems to me i should do a serious wrong to the fair casildea de vandalia in wasting time while i stop to raise my visor before compelling you to confess what you are already aware i maintain well then said don quixote while we are mounting you can at least tell me if i am that don quixote whom you said you vanquished to that we answer you said he of the mirrors for you are as like the very knight i vanquished as one egg is like another but as you say enchanters persecute you i will not venture to say positively whether you are the said person or not that said don quixote is enough to convince me that you are under a deception however entirely to relieve you of it let our horses be brought and in less time than it would take you to raise your visor if god my lady and my arm stand me in good stead i shall see your face and you shall see that i am not the vanquished don quixote you take me to be with this cutting short the colloquy they mounted and don quixote wheeled rocinante round in order to take a proper distance to charge back upon his adversary and he of the mirrors did the same but don quixote had not moved away twenty paces when he heard himself called by the other and each returning half-way he of the mirrors said to him remember sir knight that the terms of our combat are that the vanquished as i said before shall be at the victor's disposal i am aware of it already said don quixote provided what is commanded and imposed upon the vanquished be things that do not transgress the limits of chivalry that is understood replied he of the mirrors at this moment the extraordinary nose of the squire presented itself to don quixote's view and he was no less amazed than sancho at the sight insomuch that he set him down as a monster of some kind or a human being of some new species or unearthly breed sancho seeing his master retiring to run his course did not like to be left alone with a nosy man fearing that with one flap of that nose on his own the battle would be all over for him and he would be left stretched on the ground either by the blow or with fright so he ran after his master holding on to rocinante's stirrup leather and when it seemed to him time to turn about he said i implore of your worship senor before you turn to charge to help me up into this cork tree from which i will be able to witness the gallant encounter your worship is going to have with this knight more to my taste and better than from the ground it seems to me rather sancho said don quixote that thou wouldst mount a scaffold in order to see the bulls without danger to tell the truth returned sancho the monstrous nose of that squire has filled me with fear and terror and i dare not stay near him it is said don quixote such a one that were i not what i am it would terrify me too so come i will help thee up where thou wilt while don quixote waited for sancho to mount into the cork tree he of the mirrors took as much ground as he considered requisite and supposing don quixote to have done the same without waiting for any sound of trumpet or other signal to direct them he wheeled his horse which was not more agile or better looking than rocinante and at his top speed which was an easy trot he proceeded to charge his enemy seeing him however engaged in putting sancho up he drew rein and halted in mid-career for which his horse was very grateful as he was already unable to go don quixote fancying that his foe was coming down upon him flying drove his spurs vigorously into rocinante's lean flanks and made him scud along in such a style that the history tells us that on this occasion only was he known to make something like running for on all others it was a simple trot with him and with this unparalleled fury he bore down where he of the mirrors stood digging his spurs into his horse up to buttons without being able to make him stir a finger's length from the spot where he had come to a standstill in his course at this lucky moment and crisis don quixote came upon his adversary in trouble with his horse and embarrassed with his lance which he either could not manage or had no time to lay in rest don quixote however paid no attention to these difficulties and in perfect safety to himself and without any risk encountered him of the mirrors with such force 
that he brought him to the ground in spite of himself over the haunches of his horse and with so heavy a fall that he lay to all appearance dead not stirring hand or foot the instant sancho saw him fall he slid down from the cork tree and made all haste to where his master was who dismounting from rocinante went and stood over him of the mirrors and unlacing his helmet to see if he was dead and to give him air if he should happen to be alive he saw who can say what he saw without filling all who hear it with astonishment wonder and awe he saw the history says the very countenance the very face the very look the very physiognomy the very effigy the very image of the bachelor samson carrasco as soon as he saw it he called out in a loud voice make haste here sancho and behold what thou art to see but not to believe quick my son and learn what magic can do and wizards and enchanters are capable of sancho came up and when he saw the countenance of the bachelor carrasco he fell to crossing himself a thousand times and blessing himself as many more all this time the prostrate knight showed no signs of life and sancho said to don quixote it is my opinion senor that in any case your worship should take and thrust your sword into the mouth of this one here that looks like the bachelor samson carrasco perhaps in him you will kill one of your enemies the enchanters thy advice is not bad said don quixote for of enemies the fewer the better and he was drawing his sword to carry into effect sancho's counsel and suggestion when the squire of the mirrors came up now without the nose which had made him so hideous and cried out in a loud voice mind what you are about senor don quixote that is your friend the bachelor samson carrasco you have at your feet and i am his squire and the nose said sancho seeing him without the hideous feature he had before to which he replied i have it here in my pocket and putting his hand into his right pocket he pulled out a masquerade nose of varnished pasteboard of the make already described and sancho examining him more and more closely exclaimed aloud in a voice of amazement holy mary be good to me isn't it tom cecil my neighbour and gossip why to be sure i am returned the now unknown squire tom cecil i am gossip and friend sancho panza and i'll tell you presently the means and tricks and falsehoods by which i have been brought here but in the meantime beg and entreat of your master not to touch maltreat wound or slay the knight of the mirrors whom he has at his feet because beyond all dispute it is the rash and ill-advised bachelor samson carrasco our fellow townsman at this moment he of the mirrors came to himself and don quixote perceiving it held the naked point of his sword over his face and said to him you are a dead man knight unless you confess that the peerless dulcinea del toboso excels your casildea de vandalia in beauty in addition to this you must promise if you should survive this encounter and fall to go to the city of el toboso and present yourself before her on my behalf that she deal with you according to her good pleasure and if she leaves you free to do yours you are in like manner to return and seek me out for the trail of my mighty deeds will serve you as a guide to lead you to where i may be and tell me what may have passed between you and her conditions which in accordance with what we stipulated before our combat do not transgress the just limits of knight errantry i confess said the fallen knight that the dirty tattered shoe of the lady dulcinea del toboso is better than the ill-combed though clean beard of casadea and i promise to go and to return from her presence to yours and to give you a full and particular account of all you demand of me you must also confess and believe added don quixote that the knight you vanquished was not and could not be don quixote of la mancha but some one else in his likeness just as i confess and believe that you though you seem to be the bachelor samson carrasco are not so but some other resembling him whom my enemies have here put before me in his shape in order that i may restrain and moderate the vehemence of my wrath and make a gentle use of the glory of my victory i confess hold and think everything to be as you believe hold and think it said the crippled knight and let me rise i entreat you if indeed the shock of my fall will allow me for it has left me in a sorry plight enough don quixote helped him to rise with the assistance of his squire tom cecil from whom sancho never took his eyes and to whom he put questions the replies to which furnished clear proof that he was really and truly the tom cecil he said 
but the impression made on sancho's mind by what his master said about the enchanters having changed the face of the knight of the mirrors into that of the bachelor samson carrasco would not permit him to believe what he saw with his eyes in fine both master and man remained under the delusion and down in the mouth and out of luck he of the mirrors and his squire parted from don quixote and sancho he meaning to go look for some village where he could plaster and strap his ribs don quixote and sancho resumed their journey to saragossa and on it the history leaves them in order that it may tell who the knight of the mirror and his long-nosed squire were end of volume two part two chapter fourteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter fifteen of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter fifteen wherein it is told and known who the knight of the mirrors and his squire were don quixote went off satisfied elated and vainglorious in the highest degree at having won a victory over such a valiant knight as he fancied him of the mirrors to be and one from whose knightly word he expected to learn whether the enchantment of his lady still continued inasmuch as the said vanquished knight was bound under the penalty of ceasing to be one to return and render him an account of what took place between him and her but don quixote was of one mind he of the mirrors of another for he just then had no thought of anything but finding some village where he could plaster himself as has been said already the history goes on to say then that when the bachelor samson carrasco recommended don quixote to resume his knight errantry which he had laid aside it was in consequence of having been previously in conclave with the curate and the barber on the means to be adopted to induce don quixote to stay at home in peace and quiet without worrying himself with his ill-starred adventures at which consultation it was decided by the unanimous vote of all and on the special advice of carrasco that don quixote should be allowed to go as it seemed impossible to restrain him and that samson should sally forth to meet him as a knight-errant and do battle with him for there would be no difficulty about a cause and vanquish him that being looked upon as an easy matter and it should be agreed and settled that the vanquished was to be at the mercy of the victor then don quixote being vanquished the bachelor knight was to command him to return to his village and his home and not quit it for two years or until he received further orders from him all which it was clear don quixote would unhesitatingly obey rather than contravene or fail to observe the laws of chivalry and during the period of his seclusion he might perhaps forget his folly or there might be an opportunity of discovering some ready remedy for his madness carrasco undertook the task and tom cecil a gossip and neighbor of sancho panza's a lively feather-headed fellow offered himself as his squire carrasco armed himself in the fashion described and tom cecil that he might not be known by his gossip when they met fitted on over his own natural nose the false masquerade one that has been mentioned and so they followed the same route don quixote took and almost came up with him in time to be present at the adventure of the card of death and finally encountered them in the grove where all that the sagacious reader has been reading about took place and had it not been for the extraordinary fancies of don quixote and his conviction that the bachelor was not the bachelor senor bachelor would have been incapacitated for ever from taking his degree of licentiate all through not finding nests where he thought to find birds tom cecil seeing how ill they had succeeded and what a sorry end their expedition had come to said to the bachelor sure enough senor samson carrasco we are served right it is easy enough to plan and set about an enterprise but it is often a difficult matter to come well out of it don quixote a madman and we sane he goes off laughing safe and sound and you are left sore and sorry i'd like to know now which is the matter he who is so because he cannot help it or he who is so of his own choice to which samson replied the difference between the two sorts of madmen is that he who is so willy-nilly will be one always while he who is so of his own accord can leave off being one whenever he likes 
in that case said tom cecil i was a madman of my own accord when i volunteered to become your squire and of my own accord i'll leave off being one and go home that's your affair returned samson but to suppose that i am going home until i have given don quixote a thrashing is absurd and it is not any wish that he may recover his senses that will make me hunt him out now but a wish for the sore pain i am in with my ribs won't let me entertain more charitable thoughts thus discoursing the pair proceeded until they reached a town where it was their good luck to find a bone-setter with whose help the unfortunate samson was cured tom cecil left him and went home while he stayed behind meditating vengeance and the history will return to him again at the proper time so as not to omit making merry with don quixote now End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 15 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine